The meeting is live. Great, thank you. Welcome everyone to the Board Legislative Committee meeting of the East Bay Regional Park District on Monday, August 29th at 2022, beginning at 1236 p.m. Uh, I'd like to ask our Recording Secretary, Yuli Padmore, to please take the roll. Thank you, Chair Eccles. This is Yuli Padmore, Recording Secretary, taking roll. Chair Eccles? Present. Director Lane? Uh, sorry, uh, Director Waspy? Present. Um, we expect Director Lane to join us uh, as she becomes available. And um, Park District staff participating oh. in this meeting include <laughs> Eric Feeler. Present. Brian Holt. Present. Naoma Laval. Present. Katie Hornbeck. Present. We also expect uh, Lisa Baldinger uh, to be uh, uh, providing, uh, participating as well. Present, uh, thank uh, you. Oh, thank oh. you. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm here. Yeah. Great. Oh, great. Hello. Hi, Director Lane. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. And then uh, we have our federal advocate, Peter Umhofer. Present. State advocate, Doug Houston. I'm here. Uh, great. And now I'll state the ways that members of the public can submit public comments. Today's meeting is held pursuant to the Brown Act as amended by AB 361. Board members and staff may participate via phone or video conferencing. We are providing live audio and video streaming for those members of the public not attending in person. Public comments may be submitted uh, live via Zoom, via email to ypadmore, P-A-D-M-O-R-E at ebparks.org or via voicemail at 510-544-2002 as noted on the agenda. If there are no uh, further questions about this meeting procedures, uh, we'll begin. Great, thank you so much, Clerk Padmore. Um, I, I do have one question. So was Dr. Alvarez going to join us? I'm just wondering if we should still take item two first or if we should just proceed with item one. She is um, not able to attend today. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and, and start with item one, because I do see that we have Lisa Baldinger and I believe Katie Hornbeck are here. Wonderful. Oh, uh, I, we, we, so, so go ahead and do the agenda in order and not, um, and not have Brian present on state and local. Uh, well, unless Brian needs, well, yeah, I mean, unless Brian wanted to go first, I guess we could move it around, but um, since Lisa's here, we can go in order. All good. It's all good. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon, uh, Board of Directors of the Legislative Committee. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We have a PowerPoint slide deck for you all. The first item is an update on Proposition 68. Uh, the real update is going to be coming from Grants Manager Katie Hornbeck on all of the good work she's been doing. But before um, passing it over to her, uh, we thought we'd start with a little bit of background and context on Proposition 68 um, for members of the public and, and our colleagues who are joining us here today. So Proposition 68 was a park bond um, in uh, 2018. Um, it authorized $4 billion for parks, natural resources protection, climate adaptation, water quality and supply and flood protection. This bond uh, passed in 2018, but there was a number um, years of work before it went on the ballot and work done uh, diligently by the park district's uh, legislative team. Um, and of course, uh, Robert Doyle, uh, Doug and Eric all contributed to this body of work. Uh, because of the Park District's contributions, um, we did have uh, great support from the Bay Area. Something of note um, that we don't 
uh, want to take for granted is that 30.9% of the yes votes that ultimately led to the passage of Proposition 68 came from the San Francisco Bay Area. 21% uh, came from Los Angeles. And then you can see other counties throughout the state who also support it. But really, not only are those urban dense areas, they're also strong park um, supporters. So uh, thanks to the Bay Area's vote, we were able to pass this, this uh, bond measure. And then what's really important to the park district and the, the foundation and that sort of transfer from the legislative process to our competitive uh, grant program are the different program areas and funding opportunities for the park district. So these were the ones that we identified going in that we advocated on um, specifically, though at the time and, and still today we, we would share this is a little bit young or low. Um, it was keeping sort of that foot in the door for per capita funding. So the park bond did identify 200 million for per capita funding across um, the state of California with the park district being an eligible entity for that funding. We also looked for uh, funding for local agencies who have passed a local measure since November. And so the East Bay Parks uh, was in alignment to qualify for this program because of our measure FF uh, tax measure aligned nicely with the timeline of this program. Uh, we advocated strongly for funding for the Bay program within the State Coastal Conservancy, um, and that's funding that on an annual basis in the budget uh, we continue to advocate for. Additionally, funding for the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, which is a grant program that we apply for um, annually. The Coastal Conservancy's climate funding and then some competitive grants for regional agencies. So really making sure um, while the, the discussions were still in the legislative process, making sure that special districts, that independent park district like ourselves qualified for these various spending buckets. Um, and the reason we bring this back to you all today is that we've had enough time since the passage of the measure for our grants team to apply and secure a number of these opportunities. And so we thought it was a great opportunity um, to highlight that, that nexus between the legislative process and then the grant process and then the project delivery process. So with that, I'll pass it over to Katie to speak to the grants. Hi, thanks, Lisa. Uh, again, grants manager. Uh, so in summary, um, since Prop 68 has you know, come into fruition and the programs have been created with the pots of money, uh, we have submitted uh, 18 applications totaling a little over $31 million in those grant funding requests. The table here shows um, what we've been awarded, what we've applied um, that's still in the applied status or that's currently active, meaning that we, we have that grant agreement, the funding has been secured with us. Um, I will note the, the with grants, like every everything is changing so often um, that this chart is now even a little obsolete. The the very last uh, we submitted applications to um, the California Department of Parks and Recreation, the Regional Parks Program, one for Coyote Hills, one for Tidewater. And just last week, they announced their award list, and neither of our applications were picked up, unfortunately. Um, but they did offer to set up a time uh, to review our applications and, and point out, you know, some of the strengths, some of the weaknesses. Um, and how we, you know, sort of compare to, to the others that applied. Um, and uh, Lisa had mentioned the, um, the measure FF and how that made us eligible for our RIER, the, the RIER program. Um, and that funding was 1.5 million that we put towards the Roberts Pool renovation project. Um, I'm happy to drill down on, on any of these uh, in more detail if you'd like, but uh, this is a sort of high level overview of, of where things are currently at. And that's it from me. Thanks, okay. Katie. Uh, Director Waspi or Director Lane, do you have any uh, questions that you'd like to ask? Uh, yeah, I, I'm always interested in the ones that don't make it, <laughs> Katie. So would you, uh, say what were the ones that we made an effort to and they were not awarded, please? Yeah, um, so the, the couple that come to mind, um, state parks, they have the, uh, they have, I think it's a total of six projects, or excuse me, six programs that um, have, are funded with Prop 68, um, and two of which, the statewide park program and then the other regional parks program, we've applied to a couple of times. Um, uh, most recently, the regional parks program one that I had just mentioned. Um, we, we, since we haven't gotten the feedback yet, I don't know exactly, you know, where it stood. Um, they, you know, it's very um, based, and so you know, when we go through and figure out like what projects are ready to apply for money, how will they fare, and we put forth the most is what we hope to be most competitive. 
Um, so once I get that feedback, I could um, definitely follow up and see like what some of the overarching thoughts were. Um, for the statewide park program grant um, that we didn't get, we applied twice for that, um, each time with the Tidewater project. Um, they have very specific requirements on like where the where the project is located and that it's serving um, uh, you know, underrepresented or underserved communities. And so that really starts to narrow our, our uh, project list. And we didn't get it for either one of those. For some reason, they, uh, it's not, we're not getting the connection to them of, of how beneficial Tidewater is going to be for the surrounding communities. Um, and so we keep, as we get out there, every site visit, we really try to push that point. Um, so those are a couple that have come to mind. Um, as for some others that we haven't gotten, it's it's been with a variety of agencies. It's um, you know CDFW, Coastal Conservancy, um, and the feedback is often like it's a strong application, but you know usually ten times the amount of funding requests that there is money, and so um, we we just hope for the best. And like we always say, grants are risky. Uh, okay, so Doug, do you have a comment? I, oh no, it's it's more a question, just a reminder. Katie did in or and or Lisa did. I know we've applied for the statewide park program on a number of occasions, and still batting zero. Or mm -hmm. did we secure? Okay, okay. Yeah, they've had uh, two rounds, um, and we've applied to both, um, and have not have not been awarded in either. And just so for everyone's edification. In working on Prop 68 with your, your legislative team down there, we, we created this regional park program so that we, because we've had these challenges associated with what's called the statewide park program, it's just the design of the program has never been very favorable for the district. So instead of doing that, drafted this entirely new program in hopes that we'd secure some funding through that, and unfortunately, we did not. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, uh, Director Waspy, did you have comments or questions? Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, so thank you, Katie, for all your hard work and your staff's hard work and everybody's hard work. Um, I was wondering, so you had mentioned the per capita and I know it got whittled down like really, really a whole bunch. It, was there a dollar amount that the park district has received or have they dispersed that yet or, or not? Um, yes, we did receive it. Um, it was for um, just a little over 4.5 million. Um, we, um, after talking with the DECO staff, uh, ASD, um, determined that there were four projects that we wanted to disperse that 4.5 million across. Um, that went to um, Oh, it, maybe, yeah, she's pulling up this slide, great. Uh, Tidewater, uh, so it could fund the first phase of the Tidewater project, bringing in the fill. Um, and then Brioni's uh, staging area, replacing the restrooms out there, uh, Robert's pool, and then the Tyler, Tyler staging area. Um, and that that additional per capita funding um, is really sort of what made the the funding strategy whole and, and got us to, to, to get the, enough funds that we needed to complete that project. All right, thanks for putting it on the screen again. I missed that down there. That's okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Well, Katie and Lisa, both a great work here and it will be really interesting to hear what comes out of the debrief with the state parks program people because mm -hmm. particularly, um, you know, as Doug just said that there was work to make the program more uh, more amenable to us so we have to see what you know what is it that we're missing here mm -hmm. but um but yeah i certainly hold out hope for future future rounds mm -hmm. but thank, mm -hmm. thank you thank you um director eccles could i just make a com quick comment sure. i just just wanted to uh compliment katie and, and lisa for the presentation um, and just highlight that this is a perfect example of kind of the cycle of funding that this agency uh, pursues where um, our, our leadership at the state level was able to get some of these programs into the proposition and actually help get it on the ballot. And then um, now we're seeing some of the fruits of that labor coming, coming home in terms of actually receiving funds. So I just wanted to highlight that this is a great example of the work of grants and government affairs uh, together to make sure that we're making making the most of our opportunities. Great, thank you, good point. Um, really appreciate everyone's work on that. 
Okay, so if there's nothing else on this item, we'll move to the local issues and actions. Um, and we have Brian Holt and I believe Neoma is on the line as well. D D Director Eccles, uh, Chair Eccles, um, I believe uh, Lisa was going to give a short report. Oh, on I'm so sorry. I, <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, I skipped right over that. No, we definitely want to hear the second half of Lisa's presentation on the on the wildfire legislation. Absolutely. No problem. I'm flexible. I'm also excited for Brian's update. So um, <laughs> just to take a, a step on item 1B on the federal wildfire package, and, and Peter, please fill in anything um, that I miss. Just wanted to give a quick update from the Park District's perspective. So on Friday, uh, July 29th, the House approved uh, H.R. 5118, which is the Wildfire Response and Drought Resiliency Act, and it's a combination of 49 different pieces of legislation, some of which have come before this committee, some of which um, have not. And just wanted to highlight a couple of the investment areas that really stood out to us at the Park District when we were looking through the bill. Um, some of them are ones that we can apply to, but some of them are it's work that's going to complement our work by getting some best practices into the field. So the first one that falls into that category is that there is funding for landscape scale forest uh, reforestation projects on forest system land. So this is not funding that will come to the East Bay parks, but it is funding that's doing similar to work to what our fire department is doing with our stewardship department to do reforestation of native fire tolerant uh, vegetation to think about fire preparedness before the fire occurs and to really understand how fire works within the landscape. Um, and so we're excited to see a federal investment in this area. Um, and we expect that the park district can benefit from opportunities to learn best practices from the Forest Service as they implement this program. Um, a second one that we are hoping um, possibly will qualify for, but, but likely is another opportunity to learn best practices is the Ecosystem Restoration Grant Fund through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, this is a program that will support habitat, um, healthy restoration and benefits for future generations, um, and, uh, and, and be a, a response to, to climate mitigation. And then a third uh, program I just want to highlight, again, this is one that the Park District won't be able to apply for, but we do hope to share in best practices is a program for a tribal and Alaska Native biochar demonstration project. And this specifically is a project where uh, the tribal community in Alaska will be supported uh, to use biochar to feed their livestock. Um, and so utilizing a carbonator uh, to turn extra vegetation into biochar to then become livestock feed um, and create that cycle. This is a conversation we've had with Jessica Morris, the Deputy Secretary of Wildfire at a state level. Um, we at the Park District just applied for uh, some funding through the State Coastal Conservancy uh, to utilize a carbonator for our excessive vegetation. And so seeing these similar practices being used on a national level is exciting um, and something that we hope to be able to keep learning from each other. So those were some interesting areas um, of investment at a federal level. Um, also just notable in uh, the package are some definitions. So there is now a federal definition of what, uh, what qualifies as biochar. Um, there was the definition for disadvantaged community and environmental justice. And so these are terms that when we're seeing these in these packages, we're starting to track. So that way as we're not seeing the same definitions used in other legislation. We can draw them and, and share them across the across um, with our offices and our partners. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Peter, um, and then we'll be happy to take any questions. Just highlight it was a very interesting timing. This bill came about during a very busy month of July, and the the hope is is that the Senate would take up this bill, but with a limited number of legislative days left. There's lots of questions about what can come together at the end of the year. Could this House bill that just passed be included in a must pass vehicle that the Senate could consider before the end of the, the legislative year? So um, they'll break before the election, they'll come back after the election. So I'll talk more about that at another point. But the, the bill has some many elements that the Park District already does. Some some elements that the park district will benefit from. Um, but the challenge is, how does this come together with the Senate? Because the Senate has done some similar bills, but there's not the same level of appetite to move this kind of legislation right now in the Senate. So I'll stop there. 
Okay, thank you very much for the update. Um, Director Lane, Director Waspy, do you have any questions or comments for either Lisa or Peter? Uh, no other than thank you, and I'm, I'm glad biochar is becoming so popular. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when it comes to the federal legislation, it's, it's really um, eyeing best practices. It's not anything that directly is going to come to the uh, park district. Is that right? So there were two standout for best practice, which is the forest restoration and the biochar, but there is a program through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation um, that local entities are eligible for and this is for work that will protect conserve and restore lands um, to help communities respond and adapt to climate impacts um, and this is a program that in the park district's letter to feinstein and padilla um, as this legislation is being considered by the by the senate we really emphasize to not only keep that uh, program in the legislation uh, at the current level, if not higher, um, and really shared how it would benefit the park district's work. So there is potential for us to apply for um, one of the competitive grant programs within the package. Okay, um, thank you so much for keeping track of these things. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. Thank you so much for the update, very good stuff. Um, okay, so now I think, or unless anyone else has something, we're going to turn to uh, Brian Holt and Neoma. I mean, yeah, Brian Holt and Neoma Laval. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Director Eccles, uh, members of the committee. Uh, Brian Holt, Chief of Planning, Trails, and GIS, um, give you a quick overview of some of the local and state actions. We have a hodgepodge of items today that I think speak to just uh, just the variety and depth of stuff that we um, that we monitor and, and engage in and participate here at the park district. So I am going to share my screen. Are you able to see that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the report. It's uh, it's in your packet. Um, so I will um, just run through. We have a couple maps that I can uh, speak to each of these items. And I am joined here today by, by Naoma, who can uh, give some more detail on some of these as well. Um, so the first is the, the U.S. House of Representatives and the exoneration of the Port Chicago 50. I see this is on your agenda later for Peter to speak to, so um, I will let him uh, carry the weight there because I'm sure he's much more um, up to speed than I am. Uh, the next item was um, the Knights in Town uh, Community Services District um, voting to, to dissolve themselves. Um, and the way this uh, relates to the Park District is this area, you can see the boundaries here, um, the area in green is the um, is the park district's uh, none uh, nights and property. Um, and we have been working with um, Contra Costa County uh, Habitat Conservancy on a habitat restoration and flood control project at this site. Um, this property has historically accepted flood waters from the nights and community, um, and uh, the nights and Town Community Services District has, has collected fees uh, to uh, ostensibly pay for flood control, but they have uh, determined that flooding is, is not a problem in their community, so have, have voted to, to dissolve themselves. So um, we're working with the county uh, on sort of what that means for us in terms of, uh, in terms of our property and, uh, and moving forward there. Um, the next was a... Um, California Historic Resources Commission. This is our McKay uh, Avenue property, the GSA property. Um, a, uh, an individual uh, in, the, in the Alameda community uh, submitted a historic district nomination to the California Historic Resources Commission uh, to designate the um, GSA property, which is the site of the proposed Alameda Wellness Center um, and our property, uh, that we had acquired from GSA, um, along with state property, um, as a uh, as a historic district to um, recognize the service of the uh, Merchant Marines during World War II and the history of this site as a Merchant Marine Training Center. Um, that uh, went through an um, interesting process through the State Historic Resources Commission. Um, there was a lot of concern from the city of Alameda 
uh, GSA and the Alameda Wellness Center that this was a nomination that was submitted um, largely with the intent of uh, stopping or stalling the Alameda Wellness Center. Um, the, the other effect that it would have would it potentially would impact our ability to um, demolish buildings within uh, our property um, and uh, redevelop the site uh, as we're looking at in the McKay Avenue master plan. So um, that was, the item was uh, pulled um, after the state historic preservation officer actually visited the site and determined that the district lacked uh, historic integrity and opted not to move forward with the nomination. So we were pleased with that outcome. The next one, which I know Director Lane will be interested in, was uh, a pilot yeah. share program. Well, be before you before you get to that one, sure. uh, I talked to um, the state um, Diablo District Historic Resources um, person, and she said that um, people sometimes do that and don't even inform the state, which owns property, about it. And I think she was talking about this one. She was, um, yeah. and uh, we were not informed either until it was actually agendized to go to to the commission, um, which was was part of our concern there. Um, so interesting process, the historic nomination process. Yeah. Well, I think it is too, and I think the commission needs needs to add another step there because there's some people doing some wild stuff on this, and uh, not talking to landowners and then taking it straight to the commission. So I think they need to do something with their application. Thanks. Okay, so moving on to the, the San Ramon Pilot Share program, program, the Mobility On Demand Demonstration Project. This is a project led by Contra Costa Transit, uh, Transportation Authority. This is a pilot program to allow um, electric bikes and electric scooters stations throughout uh, the city of San Ramon. Um, we have historically had some concerns about these types of programs because uh, the bikes or scooters may be left on the trail or not in compliance with some of our own rules and regulations um, and just sort of the operational concerns that they have for us. Um, we did uh, reach out to CCTA um, and they also they had given us a call um, to sort of discuss this. Um, turns out the the um, technology is at a point that they can essentially geofence off our our properties. So um, as of now, these uh, electric bikes and e-scooters um, that'll be in use throughout the city of San Ramon will not be able to be used on the Iron Horse Trail uh, because uh, because we haven't we haven't we're still in discussions with CCTA about that. So um, so our immediate concerns about them utilizing the Iron Horse Trail uh, appear to be able to be addressed through technology there. But I know this has been of interest to Director Lane. Um, yeah, and then I have another question. Sure. Um, occasionally in talking about the um, bridge over Bollinger, mm -hmm. uh, there are people in Ceremon who talk about wanting to put um, not necessarily scooters, but larger vehicles going over the bridge, which they've designed and they're paying for, but which is part of our trail. So are they still talking in those terms or do we know? Um, that is not part of this project. Um, and I have not seen that recently. I know it was discussed, I think it was in one of their one of their transportation plans. I would need to go back and get back up to speed to see where, where and if any proposal for that has been, but um, it's, it hasn't been an active conversation. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, um, the Orinda Wilder Development Agreement compliance went to the Orinda City Council. Um, the Orinda City Council has been notified by the Orinda, uh, by the Wilder Development that, um, that they have no more money and that they are, um, uh, are planning to, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the technical term is, but abandon their activities at this development project site. Um, there are still a number of things that we are looking to receive from the project, including a developed staging area, some trails before we accept the Western Hills Conservation Easement. Um, so we're evaluating that in discussions with the city um, to see how we um, how we address that if the developer does in fact um, uh, 
decide to leave. And of course, Arenda also has a number of um, commitments that they're looking at from the developer as well. So, um, so that'll be an ongoing conversation. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any other questions on any of these items or on other activities that you might be aware of, uh, but that's the end of my reports. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Brian. Um, so Director Lane, did you have, yes, you have questions. Okay. Yes, um, I understand that the, um, I guess it's the Moraga uh, Fire Department um, has um, passed an ordinance that would require us to do a huge um, fuel break uh, along the edges of our property. And I am wondering if um, SAGE folks are keeping an eye on those agendas as well, because um, they seem to be um, um, a bit of a, a cowboy out there and um, they don't volunteer to talk to us before they do some of these restrictions which are illegal. So uh, is that on your list too, to um, look at those agendas? Um, it, well, it is now, of course, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I do, I see um, Chief Tiley's here. I'm not sure if she has any additional detail or, or how close she's tracking that. Um, I know she's aware of some of those issues out there um, and, and we'll be um, keeping, yes, yeah, sorry, Chief, to put you on the spot there. Oh, it's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, Director Lane, it's something that our, our legal department and the general manager and myself are working on. Um, it, it's more that kind of personality and that jurisdiction aside. Um, there are a lot of things happening in the, in the fire world right now. There are a lot of um, politicians that are receiving a lot of pressure. Um, and putting a lot of, by their constituents, and then putting a lot of pressure on fire chiefs and fire districts um, all over the place to, to make some of these reinforcements. And, and I have talked with, um, to your specific point, areas like uh, Lafayette, where if you have a home, you can go to the city, and if you're going to build a home, that is, and, and ask for an offset permit, which then puts your house on that piece of property that you bought further back on that piece of property um, that may abut the park district. And so then where does that leave us um, when they start putting in these codes? Um, so I know that Naoma and I have talked about that and um, we are starting to, to pay attention to what the different municipalities are doing around us with regard to that so that perhaps we can have a say if we are uh, going to have to adopt some of these codes. Um, and none of that is written in stone yet. Like I said, there's a lot of forward movement from a lot of different politicians and um, local um, leaders that are trying to figure out what does that look like for the Bay Area? And is that something that we can adopt on a county wide, in a county wide way? And, and that, I think my gut tells me that that's the direction it's going to go. That's the easiest thing since we are so connected. Uh, you, Drive. You can be driving down any given uh, street in the Bay Area, and all at once, you've passed from one community over into another without there being any kind of recognition. And, and so they all agree that fire passes through communities without being concerned into whose jurisdiction it's it's um, burning into. And so the thought has become, well, maybe we should be doing these, like I said, on a countywide basis. And that's, I think, if don't mean to speak for the general manager, but, but in her conversations with me, that's what makes the most sense to us. Um, Contra Costa County and Alameda County will likely have um, like codes that are very similar to each other. And so I think we're, as one of the largest landowners in the Bay Area, much like East Bay Mud, just trying to figure out where that effort is going to land and try to, trying to insert ourselves into that effort where it's appropriate, whether it be um, government affairs or whether it be, you know, fire district to fire district to figure out what that's going to look like. Okay, well, um, yes, it, it can be complicated if you're, if you're dealing with every city or, or uh, some of these small fire districts, 
Um, so I, I just want to make sure we, we're on top of it because uh, we don't want to hear after the fact that they've decided something that is probably illegal when it's applied to us. And at the same time, I mean, I, I appreciate that we are um, cooperative and, and relatively soft, you know, in our conversations generally, um, because we are a huge agency and uh, it would be easy for us to be uh, described as, as uh, arrogant if we're not careful, so. No, we're definitely in collaboration um, with both counties and CAL FIRE and plugged in everywhere we should be. Thank you. I, and I just wanted to note really quickly, I was just reviewing the budget, which came out nearly at midnight last night, the new budget, the third version of the budget. And it appears as though Rinda Moraga Fire secured $800,000. I, I don't know what the implications are, but I just thought it, it was worth pointing out. And I don't remember what the thrust of the money and where it was intended to be spent, but I can certainly get back to uh, Eric Elise on that. Good. Great, thank you. Thank you, good good discussion. Uh, Director Waspy, did you have any questions on the local issues that you wanted to raise? Uh, no, thank you. No. Great. Eric, um, is now a good time to discuss the Maritime Officers Club facility during the lo local issues? Did it's I lose fine you? With me. I'm, ha I'm having um, some connectivity issues. Um, yeah, if you, if, if Director Eccles, um, Doug uh, did listen in on the State Historic Preservation uh, Office's meeting where um, McKay was potentially going to be considered, and he noted some of the some of the attendees. So if, if it's okay, maybe just to you know, have, let him go ahead. Yeah, and give a perspective. Sure, that's okay. I'll be really quick. Um, so I, I believe the the hearing was roughly three weeks ago. Uh, the item is obviously it's to um, identify a new district, and I don't know what they're calling it down there, but it wouldn't be just a building, but it would be a district that would be nominated under the historic registry. And, and you know, the cornerstone of the district is the Maritime Officers Club, which is, I understand, slated for conversion demolition into um, a wellness center. Funding has been secured for a wellness center there. A uh, number of, um, I would, I suspect um, local, the neighbors in particular, uh, local historians um, are trying to rally against this, try to push it forward. The item was actually uh, removed or tabled for the second uh, straight going, um, probably at the behest of, um, you know, pretty influential people at the state. I don't know where it leaves things right now. Um, can it be uh, re-agendized? It's, it's entirely possible, but um, things are pretty much in a stall pattern right now. So just an FYI. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Really, really appreciate these reports on the local issues. I think it's, it's as, Beverly said it's really important to stay on top of them, especially those that are going to impact us directly, which most of these do. So thank you. Um, all right. So we'll move on now to the funding and grants to update item three. Oh, let me get my screen shared here. Can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, Katie Hornback, Grants Manager, uh, back to give my report on the grants we've applied for and grants we've been awarded since the last time we uh, I presented. Uh, so I'll start with grants applied. Um, We've submitted 11 applications between June 14th and August 8th, which is when I ran this report, uh, totaling $14.5 million. Uh, the two that I'll highlight here, give a little bit of information on uh, numbers eight and number nine. Um, so these are applications to the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority for their measure AA. Um, so we submitted these applications last year for their round five solicitation. 
Uh, this year, they did not do a round six solicitation, but instead uh, said that they were going to take a look at applications or projects that were unfun unfunded in round five. Uh, if those applicants wanted to have their projects considered, uh, to we would sort of submit update to them. Um, so what we did in that project update, in addition to you know the funding strategy and timeline, was uh, take an opportunity to address some of the feedback that they had given us um, from the applications, um, some of the, the weaknesses or uh, points that they felt were unclear in the application, tried to address those uh, to hopefully provide a better picture of the project. So they're not necessarily new applications, but we resubmitted in the hopes for um, another look and for some funding in this round. Uh, for under grants awarded, uh, we were awarded nine um, applications. Um, and the one, the two I'll highlight in this category, numbers four and number five, uh, both of these uh, aren't, weren't technically applications we submitted. These were assembly member asks, um, and they were both approved in the budget um, back in July. And so um, the 36 million for the Point Malade acquisition development and then uh, developing public access at South Bailey Road um, were both approved. And um, if, if they had additional questions on the process, I would turn that over to, to Lisa and Eric, but I uh, felt it was worth including here because ultimately those will be treated as grant funds uh, processed by the state of, um, excuse me, um, Parks and Recreation. And with that, uh, happy to answer any questions or drill down on any of these, uh, but that is my report. Great, thank you very much, Katie. Um, uh, Director Lane, Director Waspy, you have, you have questions on this that you'd like to address? Wondering, um, how we uh, thank people for the, you know, for the um, individual members' successes and. Uh, in particular, I remember um, Grayson's funds that were received for the Bailey Road part of Thurgood Marshall. So I'm I'm not really on your chart here. I don't believe Katie, um, because I at one point I talked. I was with um, Senator Glazier, and people did this thank you for Grayson, and he said, and I helped. Too. And it, it, you know, it was clearly Grayson's um, request, as I understand it. And then, of course, you need help in the other house, and he was helpful. So mm -hmm. I noticed that in our RIN, you know, we we mentioned Grayson, and we didn't say anything about Glacier. And I, I just want us to be sensitive to how people, how our legislators react. Um, so I, maybe Doug or Lisa have um, additional insight. I hadn't, I do not believe we had been made aware that Senator Glazer played a role. It does not surprise me given that it, the funding has, has to get through both entities. It has to go through two houses, so. Yeah, so it doesn't surprise me. So we can, um, we can, we can ground truth that and, um, and, and also thank him. Uh, we are intending to put out uh, a public statement and hopefully we'll have a, you know, a groundbreaking um, kind of event uh, once we once we get going on the work. OK, just keep, keep that comment in mind. Yeah. Thank you. Director Waspy, did you have anything? No, thanks. Okay, great. great work. Yeah, excellent work. Always love to yeah. hear these updates. Really appreciate um, everyone involved in this. Okay, so with that, we're going to turn to item four, advocate briefings, starting with the federal advocate briefing. Hi, Peter. Thank you. Good afternoon. Peter Umhofer, federal advocate for the Park District. Just wanted to start off on the Item number one regarding Port Chicago. We have two updates for you. One is on the funding side, the other is on the exoneration side. On the <laughs> funding side, um, you probably are aware on July 20th, the House of Representatives 
uh, pass the transportation and housing appropriations bill. Within that bill was $3 million for building restoration at Thurgood Marshall, uh, Port Chicago Regional Park. So um, coupled with the grant money that Katie was just talking about at South of Bailey Road, um, this is significant funding coming at the state and federal levels to uh, a regional park that we all care a lot about. So um, it, hopefully this holds in, in the federal process here. This is what is called a community project funding request. It used to be called earmarks back in the day, but we don't use that term anymore. This funding, um, again, was approved in the House. It is not, it doesn't mean that it has to be approved in the Senate. Um, what often has happened in the last couple of years is these projects have moved through. House has projects, Senate has projects, and they're just included the bill at the end of the year um, or as part of the process. I don't, I would not expect for us to know the final outcome of this money until probably December or January due to one, the appropriations process got off to a late start and two, um, you've got an election coming up. And so um, Congress is likely just to do a short-term funding bill to continue funding the government and all the decisions will be left until around February or the first quarter of next year. So I'll keep, keep everyone posted, but just wanted to provide that update. I think it, it's a tribute to Representative DeSalme and his work and us collectively working with his staff. So that's item number one. Um, again, as I mentioned, the fiscal year ends at the end of this, uh, at the end of September. So Congress is gonna have to decide what to do about continuing to fund um, federal agencies for through until December or until January. Um, that's been a common practice in the last few years. Um, secondly, on July 14th, the House, as part of their work on the defense, um, the defense bill, included in there the provision related to the Port Chicago 50 exoneration. And that was, again, sponsored by Representative DeSalme and Representative Lee. The Senate has not um, included that provision in their bill because there is a, the view, at least at the staff level, that not by Senator Feinstein or Senator Padilla, but within the defense committee, there is a strong view that this passed in 2020, we don't need to do it again. And so um, the Navy just needs to decide what to do. So I've been engaged in conversations with Senator Feinstein's office and Representative Solney's office. Senator Feinstein's office is doing some more due diligence and talking with the Navy. Um, it feels like a little bit of a continual loop, but I'm continuing to engage and I'll keep everyone up to date. Um, there's lots of other things we can get into about the issue and I'm happy to talk about that, but um, that's the short version. So um, secondly, the Inflation Reduction Act, also known as the Reconciliation Bill, was a process over the last 18 months that we've talked about at various times. You may remember that back about mid-July, a lot of people thought that the negotiations were over, discussions weren't happening anymore. Well, to I think a lot of people's surprise, in the end of July, around July 29th, agreement was reached between Senator Schumer and Senator Manchin that announced a bill that would be covering climate and energy, healthcare, and deficit reduction. So um, on August 16th, the bill was signed into law. You may recall it was a fairly close vote on August 12th in the House, 220 to 207. The Senate was better part of a day and a half straight. Um, these DAs blur together because it was long nights for a lot of us who were focused on this, this bill. It was a 51 to 50 vote with the vice president breaking the, breaking the tie. Phrases used in lots of conversations I had about this 
pretty historic piece of legislation. Surprised, historic, excited, just to start, more work to do. So um, it wasn't what everybody wanted, um, but that's the art of compromise and the system that we have. Um, 369 billion is focused in climate and energy. There is 69 billion is focused on healthcare and extension of the Affordable Care Act provisions. And then 300 billion for deficit reduction. So those are the overarching main focus of, of the bill. The bill will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 3% below 2005 levels by 2030. The president has a goal of 50% reduction by 2030. So it makes significant steps in that direction. In the bill, special districts are eligible for um, funding within a fairly large, not a lot of details. There was not a lot of details in this bill. I will tell you that up front. It's a lot of discretion left to the agencies to decide. 1.89 billion for the Neighborhood Access Equity Grant Program. That's to improve walkability, safety, affordable transportation access, through construction of projects. So this would be a DOT program, it would be a four-year program. So just to give you a couple other examples, two billion for a low carbon transportation grant program where DOT would reimburse or provide incentives uh, to use low carbon construction materials. Funding for that is over four years. So, um, also, we talked a little bit about biochar, woody biomass. 100 million in the bill for woody innovations grant program. This would be run by the Forest Service. Maximum grant would be up to $5 million, a 50-50 cost share. That's a 10-year program. So um, there's been a lot of talk about this for a better part of four or five years. It's great to see some funding for this um, can help communities in the West and um, entities like the Park District, for sure. Um, again, left up to the agency to determine eligible entities, but um, I've had some preliminary discussions. It, it, it definitely, they want to make sure that this program is has, has a, a broad variety of applicants. Um, just a few other samples of provisions in the bill you may have heard about. $250 million for Park Service and public lands to do conservation resilience work. Um, so these are projects on the conservation, protection, resiliency of lands. Another 250 to do for Park Service and public lands agencies to do ecosystem restoration work. Um, some of this was left over, which should have been in the infrastructure bill. It wasn't, so it was put into this bill, um, these fund, this funding. 500 million for new park service employees um, to hire new employees. This has been an issue, you know, for many different agencies, but um, for the park service, this is pretty significant. Um, there's 125 million in there for the Fish and Wildlife Service to do recovery plans for um, endangered species. Again, a huge need for a long, long time. There's also 1.8 billion for the Forest Service to do hazardous fuel reduction projects on Forest Service lands near the wildland urban interface. Again, to be determined, can this get to state and local regions if it's within proximity? It remains a question, um, but there is some other vegetation management funding as well that, um, and some also some tree planting funding as well that the park district may be able to be eligible for. It, again, it's to be determined by the agency. Uh, I will share one other thing. You may have heard about an additional bill that was an agreed to by Senator Schumer and Senator Manchin. It's on permitting reform. It would make pretty significant changes to environmental review and putting deadlines on when environmental reviews need to be done within a year or two. A lot of people are raising concerns about such strict deadlines in legislation would actually open it up to more litigation, not less, um, and actually stall a project from happening or continuing. So 
Um, there's active discussions going on about how this permitting bill could be addressed before the end of the year um, because it was not something in the Inflation Reduction Act that was agreed to that would pass before the end of the year. So lots of moving parts, but um, nice to see some legislation happening at the end. It was a pretty active July. Um, another gen item is the America the Beautiful initiative. That is to, just to refresh everyone's memory, restore, connect, and conserve 30% of lands um, and waters by 2030. Uh, the administration has recently restarted an interagency effort. Um, it's a federal council on outdoor recreation. And this has been in existence again in the past. It's focused on safe, affordable, and equitable opportunities for Americans to get outdoors. And I'll, it's just, it is consistent with the Land and Water Conservation Fund um, and other programs that we've talked about in the past, but it, they're trying to bring some coordination within these other federal agencies and how they distribute money, how they use money, how they work with partners. Um, so I've reached out to have some more discussions with some of the staff that are involved, see what their plans are. This is, again, a council that's part of the America the Beautiful, Beautiful Initiative. Um, they also recently, the administration announced on July 29th, an opportunity, funding opportunity for the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Grants. Now these are, um, this would be applications are accepted uh, through May uh, 2023 and um, people can submit as early as January. Um, so these are important land and water conservation fund opportunities. Um, so just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Just a few other items. Um, I've shared in the past, the DOT raise grant is one that we've always had a lot of interest in. The DOT um, announced on August 11th uh, that awarded 166 projects. In my quick review, uh, it appeared California received, that was awarded eight projects and I counted 10 bike and pedestrian focused projects, um, mostly in the range of 17 to 20 million was the funding amount. So um, something to watch for, it is well-funded um, <laughs> at approximately around 1.5 billion. But again, the demand <laughs> this seems to increase in popularity with this program. Um, part of it is I think because they make a decision in about six months where sometimes these federal programs, you wait a year or longer. This um, from start to finish tends to be about six months. There will be also through the infrastructure bill, um, US, the Department of Transportation is announcing something called the PROTECT grant program. And this is money that goes to states in a, in a formula. So it'll be a slug of money that goes to California to do resilience project work um, and at coastal infrastructure projects. So there's again, some details to be filled in by the state, but this is not a small amount of money. This is funds over four years, 80, 20 cost share and 1.4 billion going out to the states. Um, so divvy that up, it's not, small amount of money and something we'll continue to watch, but that those details are starting to go to the states now as of July 29th. NOAA also has some um, resilience grants that they recently announced in July. And so um, money is starting as noted before um, from the infrastructure bill and through appropriations, these announcements are starting to make their way out um, and so it's an opportunity again for the park district to consider. In terms of the legislative outlook for the rest of the year, um, what to look for. Um, I mentioned to you some of the bills that recently had passed in the July, August timeframe. So with this recent passage of the Investment Reduction Act, gun violence protection bill, some, you know, competitiveness bills, veterans bills, um, 
people are starting to, you know, obviously think about the midterm elections. And um, the White House is obviously touting many of these accomplishments um, and a lot of cabinet members going to states throughout the last month or so. Um, on the flip side, Republicans are not very happy with uh, the passage of the Inf Inf Inflation Reduction Act. And so it is unclear what the appetite is to legislate in the month of September or in the month of November slash December. Um, they've said they really don't, they, the Republicans have indicated not a lot of appetite to do much more than what we need, must do, which is fund the government and pass the defense bill. So the question becomes, what do they do in September? Um, again, the House and Senate are scheduled to leave on September 30th until the November 8th election. They will return to session on November 14th. So um, last item I'll just mention in terms of the November election, President's approval ratings started to slightly increase from I've seen 42 to 45%. Um, these legislative wins that I talked about, whether it's on clean energy or climate or prescription drugs or manufacturing of semiconductors, um, student loan forgiveness, maybe that impacts voter sentiment. Um, there's obviously been a lot of inflation concerns around the country. Some people believe that is slowed. It's a lot of economists are having varying views on that. Gas prices are obviously have provided been stable, but still very high for a lot of people across the country. Last, um, you know, there'll be a lot of focus on a lot of key races around the country, um, and many of which you're probably already following. But um, you know, you've got a 50-50 Senate. The House is 224 Democrats, 213 Republicans. And the forecasts were that the House Republicans would gain 20 to 35 seats. That's come down to maybe they, the Republicans would gain six to 12 seats, what experts are saying now. If you do the math, that's too close to call um, at the moment. It's, you know, 72 days away from the election. A lot can happen between now and then. But that's, uh, that's a short summary. Happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Peter. That was very informative. Really appreciate all the updates and it could, it's a lot of good news there. Very good to hear. Um, okay. Hello, board members. Do you have, uh, do you have questions or comments? Yeah, I have, I have just a couple. <clears throat> Go ahead. One, that must have been a really wild July, I have to say. <laughs> you know, uh, so thank you for getting by on a little sleep, uh, Peter. Then um, I'm wondering on the DeSalne, $3 million for um, Thurgood Marshall, was it, was it um, just in general for Thurgood Marshall for the park or did it? address something in particular, like the visitor center? Um, it is not the, the phrase of the language. It, it is for a visitor center. It's for restoring a historic building. Okay. But it's through a fund within the um, Housing and Urban Development, Department of Housing and Urban Development, Community Development Fund. And so it can be used um, for building restoration which is targeted as to be a visitor center in the future. But the fund is, doesn't technically fund, you know, the fund is what it is. And that was the best use of the funds that we could find and he wanted to pursue. And then to add a little bit of specificity within the application, we worked with our design and construction team on putting together a high level budget. And so this is connected to the visitor center, it's pre-construction costs. Um, and we're looking at design, study and utility investments. So not necessarily breaking ground on the visitor center, but doing that preparation work that aligns with the funding program and also with the current needs to uh, build the visitor center um, in time. We don't wanna start construction without a design, of course, so. Okay, well, that's good. I mean, it's a start. Um, what about 
funding for that visitor center through um, the National Park Service? So currently, um, East Bay Parks, we have a monthly check-in with National Park Service. And um, as a subcommittee of that regular check-in, we have created a finance um, committee. And so we will be starting those conversations on timeline. Uh, what we expect is more of a cost sharing. So 50% from East Bay Parks and 50% from National Park Service. But we also understand that funding here um, for our agency works on a little bit of a different timeline than funding at the National Park Service. They have a, a number of layers to go through. Um, and so we do want to start those conversations so we can align our efforts to be complementary, but we do um, expect National Park Service to also bring some funding to the table. Director Lane, I, I, bring, I bring a lot of skepticism to the park, the, working with the Park Service, having been working on this for five years now. Um, so I, I would, I think the community project funding request path may be a faster, better way. Um, I think the Park Service is committed to being a partner on this, but um, the funding and their process may not be the Park District's timeline. Okay, yeah, I, I can see that. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, Director Waspy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Peter. I, I appreciate your uh, your uh, the way you present these things and all the inside baseball stuff you give us. I I, I always appreciate that. I'm 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 happy that we got the three million dollars, or we're looking towards getting that at Thurgood Marshall. But I'm really I'm saddened by the fact that I mean the exoneration component. I mean, from what you described, to suggest that the people that are in charge of making the decisions have said, "Oh, let's let the Navy make the decision." Does that just send it down some rat hole that'll keep going on and on and on, while while we're trying to build a beautiful park and and honor some folks? Yeah, I, your instincts are correct. I wouldn't disagree with your assessment. Um, it, there's just lots of different pressure points here. Um, you know, I, I was very moved when I read the, the San Francisco Chronicle article about uh, Port Chicago uh, disaster. And it's a very powerful um, article, but um, you know, there are, there are political players. There's the Navy secretary, there's the vice president, there's the senators. Um, and, you know, we may need to, you know, think beyond them, um, in terms of how to bring, you know, more recognition. I just happened to see today a Smithsonian article on Port Chicago and the accident. Um, so they're starting to be a steady drumbeat of, um, the tension and media, but, um, Obviously more is needed to try and break through here. Um, but I am a little worried about, you know, having conversations with the Navy, they come back and they have told Representative DeSalme's office that um, they agree that exoneration should be done. And it has been done in legislation in the past in 2012 and 1994 for individuals. Um, so it's not unprecedented. Um, it seems to be some inertia, bureaucracy, or something else going on. Um, we'll keep at it. Thank you. Well, you know, I grew up in a military family, and there's the military way and the, and the right way, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I share... Uh, Director Waspies and Director Lane's frustration about the exoneration. It's it's um it's a real shame. You 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 think it would be a no-brainer to to just get this done as quickly as possible and not not play around. And so, you know, I, I hope I hope we can. Um uh and and if it does get shifted back to the Navy, then I think the White House has got to really step up and make it happen, which is, you know, a whole nother, not that that's easy, but um but it's the right thing to do. So it, it's got to get done. And um, Director, Director Eccles, uh, actually all three directors, um, 
we are in the, the beginning stages of um, developing a exoner an exoneration working group um, internally at the park district to, to try to get uh, the whole agency um, working strategically on, exoner on exoneration. And um, we, we will definitely keep the committee posted. As I said, it's just, just in the beginning stages, but we are intending to have sort of weekly check-in meetings to, to, try, to try to get this over the, uh, over the finish line. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate that. Let us know how we can help. We will. Okay. All right. Anything else for Peter before we move on to our state advocate? Okay. Well, thank you, Peter. Appreciate appreciate all the, the insight and all the information. A lot going on. Um, all right, so uh, Doug, welcome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, underscoring the word crazy, I don't, I don't know if you folks know where we're at in legislative session, but we have three days left. Wednesday will be the final day, <clears throat> and only to complicate things, you know, not only do we have about 800 to 900 pieces of legislation in which we need to deliberate, in process these next three days, but the legislature working with the administration or in consult with the administration punted to a significant degree on the budget. <clears throat> and just last night, we saw a whole new package of budget bills. It was, they were anticipated, but budget bills that were released in, in a, if I seem a little disheveled, it's because I've been using the bulk of the morning just trying to process what's in these budget bills, budget junior bills and trailer bills. But going back to um, June, June 13th, we passed a budget. It wasn't an administration endorsed budget. We then had what's called the budget bill junior, which is what's agreed to be between the administration and the legislature. And those pieces are grafted onto the budget. And then we had trailer bills as well. So what we're seeing and what we're reading and reviewing today is Budget Bill Junior 2. And that the genesis of this is primarily around unspent monies in the budget for climate. In the, the original budget, in the original Budget Bill Junior, um, there was $2.5 billion to be spent in the various areas of climate, climate resiliency, wildfire resiliency, um, they were scrambling to get something done by the constitutional deadline of June 31st to get a budget out of the, um, signed by the governor, couldn't do that. Um, so they've been spending the bulk of the recess trying to cobble together a deal. So <clears throat> that's where we're at. Um, I, again, I spent the bulk of late last night, this morning, trying to review the various elements of the new budget junior bill. And uh, I can report a few things. Um, it's about $106 million is gonna be available for sea level rise through the state coastal conservancy. It's called the Climate Ready Program. I think this is something that Pet Park District will likely be able to take full advantage of. It's an additional 20 million for what's called the Regional Fire and Forest uh, Capacity Program. It's more of a pipeline program capacity building amongst participants in trying to plan and implement projects around wildfire resiliency. And then there's a whole slate of money around what's called nature-based solutions or 30 by 30 investments, 132 million for uh, fish and wildlife, 176 for wildlife conservation board, uh, 50 million for state coastal conservancy, um, what I'm a little, um, what I'm lacking clarity on is there was an agreement to an aggregate amount around climate 30 by 30. And as you probably know, about two and a half weeks ago, the governor announced that we needed to spend some money to recommission, re-energize Diablo Canyon. And that's at $1.4 billion. What I'm a little unclear on right now is how that impacted, ultimately impacted climate related spending. So I, I hope to have a little bit more information on that in the, the coming hours, days, but um, it's a little bit of a gray area for me right now. Um, 
Important also in the budget is, and I know there was a lot of discussion by Peter around essentially active transportation. Um, this budget, and it's probably gonna be uh, um, awarded over a number of years, but it has $1.2 billion in it, 1.2. This is just California specifically for active transportation. And it was, it was anticipated that a bulk of the funding would address existing projects that were in com competitive application queue. But I'm learning since that they're gonna start a new, it's a blank slate. So to you, Katie, if you're still on the phone, she's not on the phone, or maybe you can share, it, Lisa or Eric share it with Katie, that it appears as though a new application process um, all previous projects are going to be uh, reviewed, considered, as well as the new ones. So a substantial amount of money is going to be available in that area. We mentioned the statewide park program where we have not been successful in securing those grants for various reasons. There is another tranche of $150 million over the next two years toward that program in the budget. And then I, I worked really closely with uh, Lisa and Eric and on a, a number of things. And one, one thing of note and, uh, was there is in the budget $35 million for recreation trails and greenways. I think we took a leadership role on that. And importantly, we had a lot of discussion around ecologically sensitive vegetation management and trying to secure Funding, $8 million, I, for you folks that were working on some of these member requests, we tried to secure $8 million. We did manage to get a champion in the Avanta. She advanced it as a delegation request. We didn't get a, a lot of traction, unfortunately, on the member request side of it. But in doubling back with uh, Ms. Bonta's office, along with the speaker's office, uh, we managed to get language into the budget and Lisa, you can help me with this, but it's, it's going to be under the Fire Prevention Grants Program, and it is very specific to exactly what we were asking for. And if you want to elaborate on that, Lisa, please, by all means. I just wanted to chime in that something I'm really pleased about with this outcome is that we are able to shift a larger grant program to be inclusive of this funding need, which um, can help benefit the park district long term, whereas an $8 million one-time request would be fabulous. Um, but that would have put us sort of into crunch mode. And then following that, there wouldn't have been a long-term funding source. And we expect this to be work um, that goes on regularly. We share um, on our, our pre-vegetation management work, uh, separate from the true mortality issue, that we do invest $3 million annually. And it's essentially like mowing our lawn. It's that consistent maintenance. We need to be doing this work regularly. And so to have this state program that will now be able to help support uh, the vegetation, the revegetation of native fire tolerant um plantings going forward is just a really exciting outcome um, it wasn't the outcome that we were hoping for it wasn't the one that we were expecting um, but it's something that i think is, is we're really proud of in terms of the work of, of our legislative department and of worth noting not only did we get the language but there's 80 million dollars that's going to be allocated to this program this year so i i suspect giving the emphasis and the new language parameters that have been placed on how this is to be awarded, I, I suspect that we're going to be successful in securing some dollars at the end of the day. I think that's about all I have to report on. Um, I think they're sessioning right now on budget related matters, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So are there any, any specific questions from board members? No, well, I, I'm sure some of my board members might have uh, some questions. And actually, I'm going to turn the the uh, chair over to Director Waspy for just a minute, um, and then I'll be I'll be right back. Very good. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so, are there any questions, comments, uh, Beverly? Um. Not really. It just, you know, it, it gets pretty complicated from here. <laughs> so, um, so you just need to keep in mind if you um, want to call to a local legislator on something, um, that's helpful. And then from our vantage point, 
um, well, from my vantage point in, in my area, I'm, I'm, ho I'm hoping funds are being pulled together for the Finley Road property that um, we have a long-term option on. So I don't know if, if Doug's been involved in any of those funds, but I know, you know, Lisa and Eric certainly have, so. Yeah, yes, and I can, um, I can speak briefly. pretty much on the periphery, but go ahead, Lisa, I'm sorry. Um, on uh, Finley Road, uh, we did put in a, a formal member request uh, to assembly member Bauer Cahan, and unfortunately it was another one that wasn't able to advance. Um, however, our grants manager, Katie Warnbeck, uh, working with senior land specialist uh, Rachel, um, they, they were able to put in a state coastal conservancy application for the full, I believe, seven million dollars. So we are optimistic that that will um, lead to some tangible outcome. And we also have an HCP um, application in with, I believe, that state parks. Uh, so we are going through the different avenues that we can. There is not that formal budget member ask outcome that we were hoping for, but we are working with our agency partners who received um, some pretty tangible amounts in this budget bill directly to I believe, state parks and WCV both received some sums for acquisition in alignment with the 30 by 30 program. Okay, we could, yeah, it's an important, important piece for us. And um, just wanted to add to, to uh, Lisa's great comments that um, uh, one of the issues that we discovered uh, when asking some of the agencies for funding um, is that many of them are woefully understaffed right now. So they're getting an infusion of funding uh, for, for projects, but they're not, uh, they don't have the staff to actually uh, allocate it to, to uh, other agencies. So that'll, that'll be something that, to watch and, and that we'll have to address in the next couple months um, as we continue to seek funding through, through grant programs. Um, and I, I just wanted to comment I, I, that Director Waspy had mentioned insider baseball. Part of, <laughs> part of our complication of the challenges that we, we had this year stemmed from lead, a leadership battle, the speakers fight for speaker. And I don't recall exactly when that was. It was early June, I think, that we had a, a member in Robert Rivas who had secured... 30 plus votes to be speaker, kind of prematurely positioned himself and made an announcement. Uh, but you need you need a majority vote to be speaker, and he didn't secure that. Uh, the vote was taken, and I learned subsequent that everyone within our delegation on the assembly side, with the exception of Alex Leaf, uh, sided with the 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 newcomer Robert Rivas, and it probably had an impact or it implicated some of these member requests for sure, because Mr. Rebus did not, was not successful. So just an FYI on that front. Um, in terms of 30 by 30, what I'm learning and Eric, good comment on the staffing. It, it, it is a, it's an issue across the board with all departments and all agencies. I've had conversations with John Donnelly um, and some of his staff on the topic. Moving forward, you know, there is a, there's an emphasis on trying to meet 30 by 30. So what does that mean? Right now we're short, allegedly we're short 6 billion acres protected preserve. They're really looking at bang for the buck at the state level, trying to acquire as much land, protect and preserve for as little money as possible. So some of these projects that are closer to urban areas where there are gonna be cost pressures, um, they might not be viewed as favorably, but I think if if they were to adequately staff up, we would we would probably get quicker turnaround time on on the viability of our projects. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that insight. Appreciate it. Um, anything else from our board member? Right, go ahead, Director Waspy. Yeah, and thanks for coming back so soon. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so Doug, I'm, I'm, I wonder that inside baseball angle, thanks for all your reports, but so you, you're talking about um, budget bill junior two, um, unspent budget funds and talking about climate action plans and things like that. I'm wondering if, or I'm theorizing, and I don't know if I'm correct that, you know, everybody's going 
back to their districts in three days to supposedly fight up until November, November 8th for re-election. But in our delegation, it, nobody's running. No, nobody has any problem here. So is this an opportunity? I mean, I think that talking about all these things and climate action plans, I, I really think, and I hope I'm correct, that biochar is going to be the hottest, greatest thing in the world uh, or, or, or a big problem for us for having so much of it. The district, if people note, uh, if it doesn't turn out to be what it is. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering if this is the opportune time to get people out there, get some of these, our legislators out into the park, see it. I'm told, I, I hope I'm correct, that we were told that this operation would be starting. We, we've already cut the contract, that they're gearing up and ready to start in September, um, which is next month, and very close. So I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, I can't help but think we could be a whole demonstration garden for, for everyone in the state and I, I hope we can really take advantage of this and, uh, I guess yeah i mean the timing time. timing's great you 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 are correct you know every everyone within our delegation is is a shoe in they're they're a lock to be reelected, and it would be a good opportunity to get some of these folks out the problem going forward is where will California be next year relative to our, our revenues? We're not going to have a we're not going to have a sizable surplus. I think we can all agree to that. So in in trying to advance programs and priorities around wildfire resiliency, I think I think it would be great for the park district to really operate as the vanguard and as a pilot program to to bring its delegation out there and demonstrate what we're doing. Um, because I think it's going to be more and more competitive going forward for revenues and, and, and how money is going to be appropriated. So I, you, you bring up a really good point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, this is very informative. And, and Doug, when the dust settles, I would love to hear an update. Maybe you could send a report through, through Eric or this. Um, about where all these different programs landed at the end of session. Once you've gonna, had a time to di digest. <laughs> it's going to take a little while to unwind everything. Yeah, yeah. of course. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Be happy yeah. to. Appreciate it. Okay. So I think we can now move on um, to our projects in pro Oh, wait. Nope. Sorry. Sorry. To our legislative program updates. I I think I have one more thing oh, to okay. report on and then it's going to it's going to shift back over to Lisa and Eric. And that is on our co-sponsored piece of legislation 2789 around uh, design build and best value contracting. Um, as you know the park district has not been authorized to do this to this date. Uh, we're piggybacking on some efforts by our um, sister agencies in Mid Penn, Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, and to secure the same sort of authorization to move forward on this, the bill has no opposition. It uh, advanced during the, the latter processes through on consent. Uh, and I believe that it's been before the governor, the bill, the final bill, the enrolled version for the last 17 days. So uh, I would suspect he's going to be acting on it within the next week in, a, in an affirmative way, we hope. Great, that's good news. Thank you for that. Okay. So if there's nothing further under the briefings, uh, we can move to the legislative program updates. Thank you so much, Doug and Peter. Really appreciate your all of, all of the information and help you provide us year round. Uh, Eric. Okay. Um, and I don't know, uh, Director Eccles, if you wanted to mention. Uh, oh the yeah. Okay, so I, I did, thank you, Eric. I did want to just mention, um, since we, as you just heard, we are rapidly coming to the very end of the legislative year. And so 
Um, my suggestion for the recommended bills for support is we can go ahead and and go through them and decide which ones that we want to support. But um, I think at this point, we would only want to send letters to the ones that actually make it out of the legislature and are going to the governor's office. And then we could uh, we could do a letter of support um, that that the governor and his staff could see. Um, and then the ones that that end up in the suspense file, we can look at them again next year, but not comment on them at this point. So that would be be my recommendation. Um, and then, you know, I guess, Doug, do you know, or have any of these already landed in the suspense file? Do you know offhand? We didn't uh, ask that in advance. Yeah. But yes. 2878 20, 20, is on suspense. Yeah. Okay, that's already in suspense. Okay. All right. Well, we can, we can briefly get a report unless if if you if uh if our directors want to hear what's in that bill we can still cover it but i i don't think we need to recommend it since it's not going to go forward this legislative session and and i and doug probably did this too we looked up the bills before the committee so i i know which ones are still I, that's the only one that's on suspense and there there's a couple that are already enrolled or being in the process of enrolling. And that's actually the very first one that fits that category, the 30 by 30 reporting. Um, that's really just an accountability uh, measure for progress in terms of protecting 30% of the state's land by, by 2030. Uh, so it would be an annual report um, that the Department of Resources would provide. They're supporting the bill. Um, so it seems, and it's in the process of being enrolled. So it does seem like likely that it will be something the governor would sign. Um, I think if we can support it now and are able to express our support, um, maybe even just verbally to the uh, to the governor's office, um, I think that that would be worthwhile. The other issue we have, Elizabeth, is that, or I'm sorry, Director Eccles, is that um, the bills that we're considering today won't be able to be placed on a full board calendar until um, until the September 20th board meeting, which will be um, after, you know, very late in the game for, for any kind of a expression of support. Um, the second bill on the list is a bill that would, would require Caltrans to consider wildlife corridors uh, in their planning process and would also develop uh, ask them to develop 10 projects uh, to get wildlife over highways uh, per year. Um, however, the bill does not have any funding attached to it. Um, it would be relying on existing funding programs, of which there are some, um, but probably not enough to do 10 major projects a year. Uh, that one is, I believe, still alive. Um, it's in the process of being enrolled. Um, as we mentioned, AB 2878, Forest Biomass Waste Utilization, is, is on suspense, will not be advancing. Uh, and we did just have a long conversation about the use of biochar, but um, this bill was intended to create uh, innovative products uh, for uh, the use of, of, of biomass. And also uh, it had a job uh, training component to it. I think primarily it was intended to address uh, some of our more rural areas where there's a lot of tree mass, but, um, and also the need for jobs and, and some creative uses of the tree mass. Um, and then we move into our federal legislation. Um, so the, the bill that would commemorate Cesar Chavez and the National Farm Worker Movement uh, basically has two main components to it. Uh, it would, uh, would um, The National Park Service would operate McDonald Hall in San Jose as a unit of the uh, Park Service, and then it would also designate the trail that, um, or, the, or the route that the farm workers took from Delano to Sacramento in 1966 as a National Historic Trail. Um, H.R. 8366, Land Restoration and Resiliency Act, provides $100 million a year for resilience projects and restoration projects. Um, it's a, it would be a grant program that the district would be eligible for as a local unit of government. Um, and then uh, in this, I thought this was an interesting bill, H.R. 8449, Fire Ready Nation. It essentially establishes a forecasting system for fire similar to what NOAA has for weather. 
Um, obviously, it's hard to predict weather and it's hard to predict when fire is going to happen, but having a mechanism in place to do some forecasting um, does seem to make to make sense. So those are the bills. I don't know, Lisa or, De, or Peter or, De, or Doug, if, there, if you want to add to any um, any of those bills, but I would recommend when we get to the end of this section, supporting all bills uh, except for AB 2878, which will not be uh, advancing. Great, thank you very much, Eric. And to your point that we won't be unfortunately taking this up as a final recommendation until the 20th, although it seems like we should be able to get it in there for our next meeting, but I guess not. Um, uh, so if that's the case, then some of these may be in suspense by then in the, on the state side. So, um, so just to clarify, my, my recommendation is we can express our support today, but obviously if in the next couple of days some of these don't bills don't advance, then um, I don't recommend you know sending <laughs> sending in our support for it. But um, but certainly for any that advance to the governor's office, um, we can go ahead and express our support. You know, I guess the only question is then, you know, if we'll have to just keep keep an eye on what the governor is signing because it, we wouldn't want to express our support after he signed it. That would be a little awkward. So um, I guess those are our, our constraints given our meeting schedule. Yeah, correct. We will keep an eye on it. Uh, right. And then we did have some bills that we were watching um, just to, uh, I can do this very quickly. Uh, SB 1167, uh, would allow state parks to directly acquire land um, and and add to their system. Um, the goal there is to help um, increase the 30 by 30 role for state parks. Uh, and um, I don't, I don't, did not look like it was advancing. I don't know, Doug, have you heard? Uh, it, did, it looked like it was pretty stalled out, but it's not official. No, no it's stalled in the House of Origin. It, I don't even think it made it over to the assembly. Uh, and then um, AB 1909, which is an interesting bill with regarding bicycles. Uh, it allows state parks to ban e-bikes uh, and it allows local authorities to prohibit class one and class two e-bikes e on their trails. So it, it will have an implication um, on the district, but I don't I don't know that it changes anything from what we're already what we're already um, pursuing in terms of a pilot and making our own decision on on allowing or not allowing. Does that sound right, Doug or Lisa? Yeah. Okay. Exactly right. Um, AB 242243 two, uh, is primarily intended, I believe, for agricultural workers, but it does put higher standards on um, health regulations for, for wildfire when, when smoke is in the air. Um, and it also uh, mandates certain uh, equipment. And um, uh, also, I believe it has some mandates for potentially breaks and uh, other, other ways to ensure that uh, health is protected when we have these those really smoky days. And um, while it is mostly intended for agricultural employees, um, I, I, do, I do believe it would have a potentially an impact on the park district. Um, and so I, I have forwarded it over to our legal and, and um, HR teams. Uh, and then AB 2319, and Doug, if you have insight on this, it might be helpful, but the way it read is it's a bill that would um, actually uh, exempt the, the city's portion of Alameda Point's land um, from uh, uh, surplus land mm -hmm. loss. and then would, um, in, in theory, that would enable uh, quicker development of housing, particularly low and, and moderate income housing. Yeah, that's accurate. So we were just wanting folks to be aware of those bills. We were not intending uh, to take positions on those four. Any, any questions? Great, uh, Director Waspier, Director Ling, do you have? We can we can also go back to the certainly to the recommended ones as well as well as the watch ones. If you have any questions or comments, Director Ling. So I have a a um, 
question that doesn't really relate to any of those. And that is, um, has there been anybody coming to the legislature with um, proposals that housing should be taking over parks? Housing? Is, yeah. Um, the locations and, you know, I've certainly heard enough other people, other <laughs> comments where people say, well, look, all you have all that open space. Why don't you do soccer fields? And, um, and why are, or are they, uh, is anybody talking about uh, removing parks and putting housing in, in parks? I, I can try to respond to that. So there's been two separate bills introduced this year, one the first session, one this session, AB 1910 by Christina Garcia, uh, Los Angeles uh, representative. Uh, the bills were essentially um, stating, and it was a voluntary program, which would require state funding to help underwrite it, but it it basically said that you, you as a local agency, if you're operating a public golf course that's underperforming or you're not generating revenue, that you can't convert that golf course into something other than a golf course. And the challenge that I had in working with California Park and Rec Society and others is that the what the bill was looking to do was allow for up to 85% of what is green space to be utilized for housing. And then it said, uh, I think it was no more than 15% for park open space purposes. I think the premise, we were challenging the premise and thought that in removing some of this green space, although albeit it is golf course and probably not the most equitable public access units around the state, that, that, was, that was problematic because in removing green space, these are already parked challenged areas. So why not inverse the numbers, make it 85% open space, passive open space, and then you know strategically allow for some housing to be built in those areas as well. It was a net loss in terms of parkland, but it was a better and uh, more equitable usage of park property in our estimation. So that's the only one that you know about that. Okay. I'm just, I'm just curious because I'm waiting for that ax um, to drop. Nothing, nothing on the parks front, but definitely public golf courses that have not been maximized in terms of public usage. And, and they're, you know, they're strict restrictive in their use just by virtue of the cost associated with golfing. Hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you, Director Lane. Um, yeah, but otherwise, um, I'm I'm fine with the recommendations and understand the timing is not perfect, but there we are. Okay, all right, uh, Director Waspy. Uh, no, I'm also fine with the recommendations, and I agree with Director Eccles that we should the pertinent ones and the important ones and the ones that are current we should be focusing on. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, can I get a, a motion then to adopt a recommendation for the the bills listed, uh, with the caveat that we will only provide that recommendation if the bills, any specific bill, does not end up in the suspense file or somewhere else. So moved. So seconded. Great. Thank you, uh, Clerk Padmore. Would you like to? Take the vote. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Director Waspy? Aye. Director Lane? Aye. Chair Eccles? Aye. So moved. Great, unanimously uh, adopted. Wonderful. So we can move on then to the programs and projects update. Like that's Eric and Lisa. Yeah. Um, well, we've kind of touched on both of these topics yes, already yeah, in this yeah. meeting, so yeah. I'm not sure there's much more to add. I, we did since we last talked about exoneration. We did put in the Yuli was kind enough to put in the chat um, the po a podcast that was 
uh, highlighted recently, and um, and Lisa found it um, from a from a non-park district source. So that's always nice to to hear. Um, and like I said, we're starting a working group. We've got some plans, but we we need to get um, our team together first, and then we can share with the board uh, what we're what we're thinking. And um, I think that's really Eric, about it. Go ahead, Lisa. One addition I have is uh, being led by our executive assistant, Yuli Padmore. We do have a community letter in support of exoneration that's being circulated right now. We have a couple different renditions. Folks can sign on via a Google document or sign their letter and either mail it in, email it over to us or whatever is most comfortable for them. So we do um, have that in the works and that community letter is going towards our senators as they're considering um, the legislation for exoneration. Great, good to know, thank you. And, and I do think one of the keys there is really getting, as Peter mentioned earlier, is getting to the administration. And it's my understanding that Senator Padilla has a, a good relationship with Senator, I mean, with, um, with uh, Vice President Harris. So hopefully there can be some interaction there, but I'm, I'm just throwing that out as board members. If you're communicating on the issue, that might be um, the approach to take. Absolutely. Thank you. And then no, nothing new. Uh, we, we pretty well covered the number of funding requests. Um, so I think we're, we're fine there, unless there's any other questions. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Um, so we can move on to the site visits and meetings. Yeah, and I would like to invite um, Flora to speak to them. I think she was at every single one of them. So um, maybe uh, go ahead and chime in, Flora, and then if, um, if you want me to comment on any of them, I'm happy to. Sure thing. Hello, everyone. Flora Chantosh, legislative assistant. We had a very exciting July and August. Um, I'll start with the July 25th um, legislative staff site visit. Uh, thank you, Director Lane, for attending. Director Coffey was also there. Um, we had uh, staff from both State Assembly, State Senate, um, and U.S. Senate uh, uh, offices attend. Um, and thank you uh, to our colleagues in interpretation and recreation and in operations for helping us get out to the Thurgood Marshall Regional Park, home of the Port Chicago 50. Um, we discussed workers' rights, civil rights at the site, um, and it was a really great chance to have some uh, intergovernmental time together um, and just some social and sort of informal time to walk the site together. I believe a lot of these staff, it was uh, their first time there, uh, which was really a great chance to, for county folks to be talking with federal folks and um, to be to share why this was uh, such an important site, why it's important to each of our offices. Um, and these folks um, will be offices that we'll continue to follow up with and share materials with. Uh, and all of them were strongly supportive. And, and Flora, just to add, um, importantly, uh, Senator Padilla's staff person was in attendance and um, we've arranged for a follow-up conversation with her and her DC, um, uh, the person who would be handling the issue in Washington. Um, and I believe that's currently scheduled for next week. Um, you know, those things can always change, but um, right now I believe we have the meeting with them next week. Um, I uh, was not part of this um, second site visit, the July 27th Marsh Creek State Historic Park. I can skip that or, or hand it over to Eric or Lisa. Lisa, chime in. Cover. Sure. Uh, we had a wonderful site visit um, in July with the state parks. Uh, planning team. So it, it, it was less of an advocacy visit and more of just checking in on both the park and the trail. And so it was shared at that site visit is that the park has many, many layers um, in terms of creating the appropriate cultural plans and resource plans for opening and that they are continuing to work to advance those items. However, um, it was established that the hope is to not hold back the park district's advancement of the three mile connection of the Marsh Creek Trail 
because of the park. And so we were able to share the alignment of the future trail, how it parallels the outside of the park and doesn't necessarily go through um, the park as it's currently being proposed. Um, and so those conversations are continuing. Um, my understanding is that our uh, planning trails and GIS department had a second visit with state parks archaeologists to continue the conversation. And so we'll check back with them um, and bring any uh, additional updates uh, to this committee. Director Lane. Yeah, so I had an interesting conversation about this park as well, and evidently um, the path that we had talked about as the possible one to go through the park is, is one of these that's over Indian burials and squirrels are digging up bones. And uh, it seemed very unlikely that uh, we would be able to put that kind of a path um, through the park, let alone the issues of going through an unopened park. Uh, so I just wanna make sure our folks who um, have been discussing the alignments for those trails understand that challenge of going through Marsh Creek Park. Yes, we were uh, pleased to have trails manager, Sean Dugan, and then a cultural okay. services manager, Anna Marie Guerrero join us on this visit. And the alignment that we shared was parallel to the roadway adjacent to the park. So between the existing road and the park, our understanding was that there were three different alignments that were considered, one of which went into the park. Um, and that was the one I believe that that touched on um, sensitive cultural areas. And additionally, it would connect to inner park trails, which would be an, a, a pretty big challenge since the park isn't open, so. Okay, good. Okay, well, thank you very much. I can continue with the next event, if that's okay, Chair. Thank you, thank you. appreciate that, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, August 2nd, uh, we got to spend some time with uh, US Representative Mark Desaulnier. Uh, this was a quick turnaround request that we received from the folks at Contra Costa Water District. Um, his his district, the 11th Congressional District, will shift to encompass more of the Delta. And so he uh, took this time um, with to bring his entire office, who uh, which was gathering for their uh, staff retreat. So his staff members from Washington, DC, and his district staff um, to um, take a bus tour of the Delta. They had several stops that day and discussed um, a lot of Delta interests, stakeholders, different issues uh, within the Delta. And CCWD, which organized the bus tour for his office, um, asked, our, um, asked the Park District to host the final stop, which was at Big Break Regional Shoreline. Uh, so again, our thanks to um, our colleagues in interpretation and recreation and operations, and our planning colleagues who attended. Um, we were, it was a very quick, um, uh, uh, pit stop for the congressman, uh, uh, and we were able to show the location to his staff, um, look, uh, talk about the Delta Atlas, talk about the uh, incredible Delta map um, there at the park, uh, and it was a really great chance to um, talk a little bit more about um, the, the park district's uh, Delta work and the ecology there, uh, and it was a, a great chance to uh, reconnect with the representative. Anything additional, Eric? Otherwise, I'll just move on. Only in that, um, just on the theme of exoneration, I was able to talk to him a little more, um, sort of in between walking uh, to different sites at this facility. And um, he's definitely been communicating with Senators Feinstein and Padilla and kind of gave, just gave me a report on that. And President Coffey was also there at this event. It was a great chance to um, have some time with with Representative Desaulnier, uh, but you'll notice it's not the last time we saw him in August. Um, so uh, bring us to a close here. Uh, we finished the month with, um, well, in in the um, during the month of August, we had two walk and talks. Uh, the first one was August sixth with Representative Eric Swalwell. Uh, his walk and talk took place at Lake Chabot Regional Park. We met at the marina. Um, uh, President Coffey attended as well. Uh, we took a, a walk out uh, where our uh, naturalist spoke for a bit. The congressman um, had a, a number of questions from 
uh, constituents. Um, I counted about 120 attendees. We were a very large group. Folks know how busy Lake Chabot is, especially in the summer. It helped that we started early, but it was still very obvious that we were a, a large group of people. Uh, his his office was very excited for this event. They've come almost every every year, I believe, uh, and um, they're looking forward to to future ones as well. Uh, and oh, go ahead. Oh no, I just said sounds sounds great. Yeah, you can continue. Thanks. It was lively. <laughs> it was a very lively walk and talk. Uh, August 13th was our second August event with Congressman Desaulnier. Uh, this was also a community walk and talk, and it took place at Thurgood Marshall Regional Park, home of the Port Chicago 50. Uh, and this was our, um, this set a record for attendees for uh, all of our walk and talks hosted ever, I believe. Uh, it was close to 130 folks, something like that. Uh, just really excited community members who attended. Um, President Coffey was there as well, uh, and it was just a fantastic chance to share some of the history of the site, the civil rights and the workers' rights uh, um, events that have taken place here. Uh, and again, our thanks to our colleagues who helped us uh, bring this bring this event to life. The representative was incredibly happy, uh, and there was a lot of great um, follow-up media and uh, social event, uh, social media um, excitement about this event. That is all I have. And just uh, looks like uh, Kevin may still be on the on the uh, Zoom. I just wanted to thank him for his work on that, on that um, walk and talk. It went, went exceedingly well. And, and as always, Kevin did a great job. Great. Well, I'd like to share my thanks to all involved. I love these walk and talks and, and wow, 120 people and 130 people. That's, that's great. It's really great. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Flora, Eric, everybody involved. Um, and did either Director Lane or Director Waspy have anything they wanted to add? Mm, no. I just just that I'm very, very, very sorry I missed the walk with Eric. I, I was out of the country at the time, but I always enjoy his his efforts to get the folks out there in the parks and talk about a lot of issues and really enjoy the parks. And, uh, I, and I look forward to meeting with Alex Lee this Saturday, I think, um, at uh, Quarry Lakes. So thanks for doing these programs. I think they're very valuable. Great, thank you. I see that um, uh, Mr. Well, Kelly has his his uh, hand up. Um, I, I, uh, Yuli, would you like to check to see whether it's on this item or whether we're getting ready for the open forum public comment? Open forum public comment. Oh, okay, great. Just being proactive. Thanks. Appreciate that. Okay. Well, I think we're um, we are through with this topic. We can move to. Item number six, and um, if you'd like to go ahead and make your comment, feel free. Uh, thank you. Um, first off, uh, uh, one thing that's uh, uh, going to be uh, was on the legislative agenda earlier today, but it's going to be uh, the uh, one of the more important things. Uh, a new a new study just came out and said that uh, they didn't do a dynamical energy uh, uh, climate uh, simulation. They did a, a mass balance and energy balance. And they said that uh, you were guaranteed to see a, a foot or two of sea level rise just from uh, melting ice out of Greenland on the edges of the great, uh, glaciers, which is in addition to all the melting ice that we already heard about. So it's another foot or two in the, in the next you know, century or so. Uh, which is going to be huge. Uh, that's a, a large amount of ice. Um, when we talk about um, uh, Port Chicago 50 and exonerating them, uh, they were one of the issues there was dangerous working conditions. And, uh, you know, I was just, uh, I don't know very much about that, uh, that incident, but I do know, uh, I was just looking at the Battle of the Little Bighorn and the US government went and recognized and now officially recognizes the native political positions over there. Natives were fighting against genocide and land theft, um, you know. And so, if we're if we're willing to to do that for people that are fighting and killing uh, U.S. Uh, uh, you know the U.S. military soldiers, then uh, you know we should be uh, more uh, give more considerations to the 
to the people at the, the to exonerating the Port Chicago 50. Uh, you know, they may, they they they're, it's uh, they seem to, you know, we we should be a lot more uh, generous and forgiving. Um, and then as far as uh, native acknowledgments, another form of native acknowledgement, uh, we like we're talking about biochar, you know, and we're act, everyone acts as if biochar is this it's a fancy new name, and uh, we we just invented it. It's very high tech. Uh, well, let's do the native acknowledgement here. Uh, this was invented uh, uh, thousands of years ago in uh, in the Amazon. It's called uh, Terra Preto do Indio, and uh, it's a mixture of charcoal, bone, pottery, very complicated, compost, manure. They 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 had a whole uh, scientific recipe for it, and uh, they were doing this through uh, slash and char, slash slash and burn, and uh, slash and burn agriculture. So uh, this is you know very high tech stuff. And it's uh, should be native acknowledgement all the way, because it that's where they got the idea, um, and and that's who invented it. Um, and then uh, with this idea of uh, putting housing in parks, well, we've already been doing it for a while. Um, the the main main uh, uh, idea is putting housing outside the urban limit boundary. And the first example of that was at Darty Road that I can think of. A big one was eleven thousand units at Darty Road. Um, over there, and uh, various people uh, fought on both sides of, of that, and ended up uh, being supported by one water agency and opposed by another water agency, um, supported by Zone Seven, opposed by East Bay Mud. Same thing now at Sahara, where East Bay Mud is filing suit against this hundred units, um, and uh, this this is very it's it's. It's um, uh, the, the way this is working out through the, the, the various land fights about uh, building, uh, building more units out into the hinterlands, um, it's turning into a checkerboard, you know, kind of like what they did with, uh, with, with, uh, with forests. You know, the, the, the corporate forest management was a checkerboard of clear cutting. We're going to end up with a checkerboard of housing out in the, in the rural areas. And my problem with that is not is not that I don't like checkerboards. It's that these the people who live there are going to start doing things like the people did in, in at Mission Peak in Fremont or at uh, Castlewood in Pleasanton, and they're going to start uh, fighting against parks and trails and op and uh, and visitors and bicyclists in their backyards in the trails, and that they're going to be the 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 most earnest and diehard opponents of more trails, and that's uh, that that needs to be. Uh, corrected because that's a bad thing. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Um, all right, well, I would just like to uh, acknowledge all the great social media, appreciate Steph's help and also appreciate um, getting to see that on a regular basis. And I don't know if... I don't... I don't think we have much of a update. Um, I don't know, Flora, if there's any of them that you might highlight in terms of responses we may have gotten. I, I know we have gotten some um, uh, inquiries on exoneration, I believe, through uh, the through the um, social media account. But uh, is there anything else, Flora, that or Lisa? Uh, nothing. Um, uh, nothing pressing. Just that it's exciting to engage with our federal representatives on Twitter. They have an immense following. Uh, and so the, just sharing event photos, uh, our followers clearly seem to enjoy that. It was a, yeah, it was an exciting month. Great. Good job. I would just want to highlight a future post that will be hard to put in the pocket. Uh, Yuli uh, Padmore did an on-site interview of Representative DeSaulnier on the topic of conversation. And I believe she and Flora will be coordinating to get that up later today. So hopefully we can share a link out with this committee as well. Great. Thank you. Look forward to that. Well, thanks to all of you. Uh, Lisa, Flora, Yuli, Eric, appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, board comments. Director Lane, Director Waspy, anything? Anything further, I should say. <laughs> Director Waspy. Well, sure. I'd just like to say that I, I'm. Uh, you guys are really on the uptake here, uh, the legislative affairs staff. I mean, I'm really loving these uh, local issues updates. I really love the the um, 
the uh, news, uh, weekly news updates we get, and and then also the uptick of all the um, legislators coming to the parks. I, I truly appreciate this, and I think we're really going in the right direction. And I, I get a lot more information. It's it's great, as are uh, Doug and Peter. Always great, but it, the, the the addition is great too. So thank you very much. No, and and. Um... I'll, I will second all that Dennis said there because um, I really enjoy getting the reports uh, on Sage and the and the up to date grant information as well. I think that's been very helpful. And um, congratulations to all of you getting our legislators out there. I I talked to uh, Colin um, yesterday at Ira's retirement, and he said that Swalwell was so pleased to be there and he was just ecstatic with the number of people and complimentary in many ways and so um so that's always good thank you everybody for your work yes well i i would like to ditto the comments of my uh both director waspy and director lane uh, really great work a lot of good information um very exciting to get our legislators out there it's so important for them to uh, see and feel and breathe the, the work that we're doing every day and, and um, makes a big difference. So uh, really appreciate the information, appreciate our advocates and uh, yeah, onward. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So meeting is adjourned and unless there's anything further, speak now. I think we're done. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you.